It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search it out is the glory of kings. This is the Message to Kings podcast. Episode 144, The Prophet Elisha and Christian Discipleship. After mountain climber Elijah comes down from Mount Horeb, his first task is to visit Elisha. Who Elisha is and where he comes from again is a mystery. Most likely, Elijah already knew him, and he was some guy with potential that Elijah already knew. So if this is your first time with this story, sorry, the names are complicated. Elijah, with a J, will be appointing his successor, Elisha, with a Sha. By the way, remember how Elijah said there was no one but him? Funny how God is giving him a successor when he didn't think there was any other prophets. 1 Kings 19.19 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shephat. He was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. I like what Josephus says here. He says that when Elijah's cloak, this is his outer garment, touches Elisha, he starts to prophesy immediately. How awesome is this? Elijah has the Samuel-type anointing. Remember when the company of prophets caused Saul to prophesy? Elijah has entered into a new grace that allows him not only to carry the gift of prophecy, but now the spirit of prophecy, which comes upon others now that accompany him, or even touch his anointing or his mantle. 1 Kings 19.20 Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? All right, so get used to this. Elijah talks pretty weird. If I told you what I have done to you, you would think I'm offended at something. Not Elijah. I have to chalk this up as Elijah just speaking different. Using our reference to prophets as the ones with the force in Star Wars, Yoda always talked backward and really strange. Elijah the same. He speaks with an element of awkwardness and offense in his language. Though it appears Elijah has a problem with Elisha's request, we will find over time that Elisha to be a man of utmost loyalty and faith. His actions actually reveal authentic honor. Also, we've got that implication of Elisha now becoming Elijah's Padawan to learn the ways of the power prophet and to harness and understand the Holy Spirit. He desired to both say goodbye to his father and mother and follow Elijah. Elisha understood he needed to honor his father and mother. For the fifth commandment is to honor your parents, that your days may be long in the land and that the Lord your God is giving you. Elisha shows this in this scene. Jesus would later make a statement that no one has his place in the kingdom of heaven if he hasn't left his father, mother, brothers, or sisters. There's another scene where a man was called of Jesus, but he said, First, let me bury my parents. What do you do with these contrary statements? Well, where there are contradictions, there's a hidden wisdom. We're called to honor our parents, but not be controlled by them. There is a time when the eagle must leave the nest and make its own way. Regarding the man who wanted to bury his father, there's an implication that he first wanted his inheritance prior to going to be with Jesus. We must honor our parents and their godly examples and their teachings. But we must also follow the Lord. The reward of this honor is long life, like the commandment states. But even more importantly, our Heavenly Father trumps all earthly fathers. We must honor God above all and be obedient to our calling. Elisha received the calling and future mantle of Elijah and desired to honor God's new calling of being a governmental prophet. But first he desired to honor and say goodbye in an honorable way to his parents. 
Elisha honored his parents and family and townspeople and went away to serve God and honor God the rest of his life. It's like he wanted one night before he was going to ship out on the permanent mission field. And he goes back and celebrates with his town with a massive, massive barbecue. 1 Kings 19.21 So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. There's lots of symbolism here going on. There's the, there was 12 oxen symbolizing God's government, and Elisha will definitely be a governmental prophet. After the going away party, Elisha catches up with Elijah, and who knows where he was, but he finds him. Once they unite, oh my, there's going to be power on display in northern Israel, a future school of the prophets. Yeah, resurrecting the old school of the prophets from the days of Samuel will happen again. And don't think we're done seeing wonders. There will be many more, and they will overflow into the time of just Elisha and after. And now we don't know exactly where they settle in to live, but reading ahead we can assume because Elijah is a country guy. He settles in the country of northern Israel, in the countrysides, not in the towns, away from the cities, and makes his home there. Elisha, apparently, later will build a few houses for a school of prophets on the Jordan River. And later, Elijah calls down fire from heaven again and scorches a brigade of northern Israel soldiers twice. With these accounts, it appears Elijah and Elisha roam the countryside with prophets in accompaniment. There is no further statements like Jezebel killing off the prophets, so it appears as long as Elijah doesn't confront Jezebel, she lets him do his God thing. Mortal enemies keeping their distance for a while, but keeping an eye on each other within the same kingdom. This status quo appears to not ruffle any serious feathers until the event in Naboth's vineyard and other future events. All right, so let's chat about symbolism here. Elijah represents the John the Baptist of the New Testament. Elisha represents Jesus of the New Testament. Elijah, because he dwells in the countryside, they dress alike, and he prepares the way for another greater than him. Further, Malachi 4, 5 states, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. John the Baptist comes not with power miracles, but the message of repentance and the kingdom. Elisha dwelled in the cities like Jesus did. He was more educated, at least according to his speech patterns, and he appeared to be more cultured. He came after Elijah in power, and his assignments were more like Jesus than John the Baptist. He represented the government of God as a governmental prophet. He spoke to the powers that be instead of confronting them like Elijah did. Both Jesus and Elisha would both be betrayed by someone, and they would both die, according to outsiders, an unexpected death. I'm sure we'll cover more of the symbolism, especially with Elijah and his tie-ins, and the eons-old story at the time of his death, or lack thereof, in a future episode. Next, we accelerate to the final three years of Ahab's 22-year reign in the next episodes. The conquest of the Arameans, the incident at Naboth's vineyard, which sets the downfall of Ahab in motion. The invasion of the Assyrians in the Battle of Karkar, which disastrously weakens Ahab, the defection of the Moabites, and Ahab's final battle. To conclude this episode of Message to Kings, we have to discuss the concept of discipleship and the multiplication of one's anointing or calling. All through history, there are, has been many examples of great men followed by great physical or spiritual sons. What's cool is that Elisha will become Elijah's spiritual son, though not his physical son. Elijah's life is replicated or his life's work is continued in the life of Elisha. In today's Christian vernacular, Elisha will become Elijah's disciple. When Jesus returned after the cross, he came back and preached to the disciples and gave them the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18. Then Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit 
and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Notice how it didn't say go and get everyone saved. Instead, it said go and make disciples of nations. A disciple is defined as one who is a follower, one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of another. A Christian disciple is a person who accepts and assists in the spreading of the good news of Jesus. Discipleship creates accountability and allows for personal hands-on growth. Discipleship is an accelerator in personal growth and learning and the ways of God. Elisha is going to learn years worth of knowledge in his first weeks of walking the countryside with Elijah, accompanying him in his ministry. Everyone who is a student or person in industry and work, they must learn their trade. How do you do this? In the marketplace, someone must do the training and programs and set up and everything to get the new people going. In class, who do we learn from? In life, there is teachers in abundance that teach us. Very few of us have a literal teacher-mentor relationship like Elijah had with Elisha. If you are blessed to have a hands-on spiritual hero training you, that's quite rare and really amazing. Make sure to honor this person and to learn and to soak up all that you can because it's so rare in this society, in this time, in this age, to have apprentice-like relationship with a, someone above you. There's much to learn from this. Each of us is being discipled whether we know it or not. If we are obedient to the Spirit's calling, God is discipling us through a variety of means. Most of us have, most of us have been influenced by a multitude of sources and teachers and role models in our lives. Most importantly, we must have spiritual role models and teachers that mold and influence us. If you have an Elijah in your life, honor this person. That is so amazing. Elijah is going to teach Elisha all he knows, but Elisha is still going to keep his own personality and calling to go with the new teachings and anointing. Each will still be uniquely different. Now we go on to the discipling. And our assignment and task of discipling nations. This is where I ask you the question, are you discipling someone? It's part of our calling to share and to pass on the things God has given to us. If God has put a message or something in your heart and a topic of study in his word or something that he's uniquely gifted you with a passion for, he wants you to study this and eventually give it away. It's the way of the kingdom. We must learn how to teach and give away what God has gifted us with so that others can catch the passion and calling and spread the message of God's special grace that he has given you. Elijah was a power prophet, and he's going to pass this on to Elisha. What's your gift? This is what you give away. So how do we know who to disciple? Ask yourself two questions. Who has God put in front of you? Whoever God has placed in front of you, you are to disciple. If it's your spouse, your children, your friends, your co-workers, the guy you run into at the coffee shop three days a week, the clerk at the grocery store that wants to get to know you, this is your assignment. Don't be disturbed with your assignment and who it is. We are all in training all the time. Every pastor must start with one. Every evangelist must start with one convert. If you are faithful in your assignment, you will be given more. In fact, when I started burning for God, God placed this guy in my path. He was really, really cool, and he seemed to be really hungry for the things of God. But after months and months and befriending him and praying with him, he seemed to be not wanting to get past his old hurts. And some really bad decisions he made in his life were haunting him. But he refused to forgive himself and others. In the end, after helping him over and over and over, it seemed he never could get over this hurdle. In the end, I thought I failed with him until I came to understand that I still was faithful and God was more than impressed with my faithfulness. It was him that didn't change. Regardless of his decision, I was still faithful and this is what mattered to God. Soon after, God put others in my path to disciple. Regardless of the final outcome, faithfulness matters. I share this story because I think it will help others out there listening. 
So the first question was, who has God placed in front of you? The next question is, where is the spiritual hunger? God loves to fill spiritual hunger. Who around you is hungry for the things of God? This person needs you to assist them. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. Follow the hunger. You just may be the one to bear the heavenly fruit that they need in their lives. Regarding how to disciple someone, be brave. Tell your testimony about your life and what God has done. This makes things personal and then share with them the things of God. So we finish this episode with the prayer that God shows who we are to disciple, how we are to disciple, and the ability to follow and to feed the spiritual hunger around us. Lord, help us to recognize those around us who are you've assigned us to disciple. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear the spiritual hunger around us and to feed this hunger with the things of God. Fill us, Lord, with your presence and your word and a zeal to share with all those around us your love and your heart and the ways of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Message to Kings. Feel free to visit the website, messagetokings.com, share the Facebook page, or if you want to chat, email us at messagetokings at gmail.com.